Hey everybody, it's Mr. Hefner. Uh, you probably knew that, but just in case you didn't recognize me without the bow tie, I thought I had to tell you. Anyway, I'm making this video today on a scout remote snow day in January of 2021. Hence the casual attire as I go out and clear snow, come back in and teach a lesson, go out and clear snow, come back in and teach a lesson. So what I want to do now is I just want to give you a brief introduction to Charles Dickens. Over the summer, you read A Tale of Two Cities. And one of the things I've always enjoyed about literature is finding out a little bit about the author. I know you can enjoy any book without knowing anything about the author. A book can always stand on its own. But when you're doing classic literature, especially something from a, a, a different time period than our own, uh, there's just something a little enriching about understanding uh, how the author grew up, what things were important to that author, and then to start to look at how that might have influenced that author's style. So let's get started. I was very clever in titling this presentation, Meet Charles Dickens. You have no idea what it's going to be about probably, but it's about meeting Charles Dickens. And there's a classic photograph of Charles Dickens. So he was writing in an age when we could actually take pictures of authors. But I always like this one because it reminds me that every word of every Charles Dickens book was written longhand, it was written with a pen and some ink to dip in on sheets of paper, editing by scratching out words and then sending everything to the typesetters to be uh, set up and printed and, and bound in a book. So we're going to take a look at uh, a little bit about the author's life, the time period in which he lived, uh, and then I'll, I'll just throw some titles at you uh, that you probably recognize anyway uh, that are other works that, that he wrote. I've got an essential question for this video for today, and the question is, what are some ways that Charles Dickens' life may have affected A Tale of Two Cities? Now, again, as I said, anyone can read A Tale of Two Cities and enjoy it without knowing the first thing about the author. But I think it's kind of fascinating to see the connection. I've always been interested in the creative process. Let me point out to you as well something else. In the lower left of this video, you see this icon that I've made here. That is supposed to look like a Cornell note sheet. And it's got a blue circle around it. If you see that on a slide, what that's saying to you is this is important. It's probably something to put in your Cornell notes. And if you're doing Cornell notes, you know that if, if you list the essential question for any lesson or a video, that's what you can do at the bottom of the page. Instead of writing a summary, you can simply write your answer uh, to the essential question. Now, what about this time period in which Charles Dickens lived? It's, it's called the Victorian era. era and, and it was named for the Queen of England, Queen Victoria. Now, look at that. She's born in 1819, and she lives to 1901. So that's a pretty long life, you know, for someone, even a queen in those days. The period of time when, in which she lived, in England at least, uh, is sometimes seen as, as kind of prudish. Now, what I mean by prudish is the middle and upper classes had a proper way of doing everything. Uh, they were a little bit repressed as far as emotions go and things like that. And a lot of people today might say they were, were very old fashioned. You can see this uh, in the manners of the day and how people behaved and how they were expected to behave. But you can also see it, for instance, in the way they dressed. So you've got ladies dressing uh, with, with lots and lots of, of undergarments and petticoats to fill them out and cover up their bodies. Uh, men are always uh, wearing full dress coats. So you, you, today it's okay to go out in public wearing nothing but a shirt, maybe even rolling up the sleeves. Uh, for Victorian England, uh, you would have had a shirt, you would have had a waistcoat, uh, you would have had a, a coat over that, and uh, you would have never ever shown your arms to anybody. As far as the, the time period goes, it's going to be a time period of, of great advancement. So science, especially medical science, is going to make uh, huge leaps at this time. It's uh, sometimes called the second industrial age and the cities in, uh, in England, mostly London, are, are going to be dirty. There are going to be factories burning coal, belching out black smoke, which then settles down on everything. Uh, people worked, the, the lower classes worked 12 hour shifts, not an eight hour shift like we're used to today, but a 12 hour shift. And they worked this six days a week. Sunday was the only day that they had off. Uh, the population was growing quickly, but there was a certain sense of pride in England at the time uh, that comes out of something called imperialism. 
So you might have heard the old expression, the sun never sets on the British Empire. It's because at this time, uh, the, the British Empire had colonies all around the planet. There, I'll, I'll show you a map in a, a little bit here, but there literally was the sun shining on British territory uh, somewhere in the world at all times of the days. The economic classes were clearly delineated. So there is the working class. You're going to see this working class showing up in a lot of Charles Dickens stories. Uh, you're probably familiar with, for instance, the, the short novel, um, A Christmas Carol with Ebenezer Scrooge. And you know that the working class features prominently in there. They work hard, they go home to large families and they have trouble making it every day financially. Uh, these people weren't like today where you, you were hired at a job and, and that's what you did and you got a, a weekly salary. They went in every day, they got paid at the end of every day, hoped to go back the next day and get paid at that. We call those uh, day wages. Uh, the middle class, on the other hand, somebody like a, a Bob Cratchit, uh, they, they would get a salary and they did whatever it took to do the job, but they were generally what we would call today white collar workers. They didn't work so much uh, with their muscles and with their hands, they worked with their brains. So they were often scribes and accountants and, and things like that. And then there's the upper class. And the upper class are not people who make money, but people who have money. They were usually born into a particular class. Uh, they're seen as being better uh, than everyone else by birth. That's an idea that's repugnant to the American way of life, but they were seen as being better just by their birth. They owned land. They were able to tax people who were using their lands, collect rents and, and things like that. Uh, and they generally uh, got their education at private schools that were very exclusive. There's a picture of Queen Victoria. I always look at this picture and think, she needs a bigger crown. That crown is just too tiny and cute on her head, but that's just being, being silly. You notice down here as well, uh, there's nothing from this slide that you're going to need to know for a test, just a little enrichment stuff about the time period. Uh, Queen Victoria came to the throne in 1837. Uh, by 1876, which is the American centennial, a really big year for us. That's the year, for instance, if you're looking at American Lit, that The Adventures of Tom Sawyer was published, if that helps put things in perspective. Uh, she's not only the Queen of England, uh, but she's also the Empress of India. So India was the largest uh, single colony uh, that fell under that British Empire kind of uh, overarching umbrella there. Uh, her husband, was Prince Albert. Prince Albert was never uh, a king. Uh, he dies in 1861, and she is going to continue to reign until uh, 1901 at her death. So she is going to live her life as queen uh, pretty much uh, as a widow most of her life. By 1887, uh, they were able to celebrate a, a, a golden jubilee it was a huge celebration. Mark Twain traveled to England. He was promoting his own books at that time. And so he was able to witness this. And uh, it was evidently such a, a huge celebration that he said it stretched uh, to the limits of your sight in uh, all directions there. In all of her life, this is probably not to be, uh, it's, it's not that unexpected. Uh, she survived some assassination attempts. There are always going to be people not happy. Uh, 1896 is the Diamond Jubilee. Uh, she surpassed King George III to be the longest reigning monarch. She was 81 years of age when she died. Anytime a British monarch has a, a, the era named after him or her, the Georgian, the Georgian era, the Edwardian era, the Victorian era, uh, the Elizabethan era, uh, this means that we associate uh, the time period with that monarch. And so something usually happened in that time period that we can start to see as this defines the age. And that's what we're talking about here with Charles Dickens. We want to just understand this Victorian age in which Charles Dickens lived. Uh, there's a map for you. Uh, that's a world map. And everything that's in red was part of the British Empire at the time. This tiny little island, you know, in Europe uh, at one point was all of this. You look at Canada, how... how huge that is. It wasn't until 1867, two years after the American Civil War, that Canada was given its independence. During the Victorian era, uh, expectations were very different for men than they were for women. Uh, gentlemen were uh, homeschooled until, until they got to the point where they could go to public prep schools. Now, public school to us 
isn't what public school was at that time. Public school was something that uh, only wealthier individuals could go to. It wasn't really public. If you were part of the everyday working class, school wasn't something that you did. You didn't learn to read and write. Uh, there was a very low literacy rate among the working class at that time. These here names like Eaton, Harrow, Rugby, Winchester, uh, those were some of the, uh, the more exclusive schools that were around at the time and are still around today. So they've been around a very long time. And men studied the typical university type subjects, mathematics, philosophy, law. They would read classic literature, but classics in this case means they would study the classics from the ancient Greeks and Romans and they would read them in, in Hellenic Greek and in Latin and then translate them. Now, if you were a woman of, of this gentle class at that time, uh, you were uh, educated at home until you could go to boarding school. A boarding school was a place where you lived. And you were not taught these academics like the males were, uh, you were taught the arts. And so your language would be French because that is the language of the arts. Uh, you were taught domestic skills like cooking and, and sewing and how to entertain guests and keep your man happy and all those. Yeah, it was very sexist. I, don't get angry at me. I'm just sharing this information with you. Let's talk about Charles Dickens though and Charles Dickens early life. So this is actually the house that uh, Charles Dickens was born into. His father was a, a clerk. If he was British, he'd say a clerk, but a, a clerk wait, working for the Navy. Uh, and this is a fine middle-class working middle-class uh, house here. He's born in 1812, February 7th. You don't need to know those dates. His parents were John and Elizabeth. And like I said, John was working for the Navy. Uh, the family grew considerably. So when Charles is born, he's the second born, but eventually there are six more children who are going to follow him. And as the family increases in size, unfortunately the Navy income does not, and they start to struggle. This is a, an aerial shot here of Portsmouth. They, they moved later on to, uh, to a place called Chatham Village, which is inside the larger town of Rochester. Charles describes these years growing up as a boy, uh, the, the five happiest years of his life, of his childhood. One of the problems is in England at the time, if you borrowed money that you could not pay back, you could go to jail. And the problem was, not only did the debtor go to prison, but the whole family went to prison as well. We'll talk about that in just a second. Here's a modern day uh, picture of very quaint Rochester, England. They have a Dickens Day parade every year. And you can, if, if you've ever read any uh, Dickens books that, that take place in Dickens' lifetime, this is exactly the kind of street you, you always picture. Modern day, again, Google Street View, uh, the house on the corner, is the one that Charles Dickens then lived in, that the family lived in when they were uh, in, in Chatham Village here. You can see it's modern. They've evidently got a satellite TV today. Charles Dickens didn't have that. But there is a sign down here that tells you that this was Charles Dickens' house at one point. Now, the financial collapse happens when Charles Dickens is 10 years old. The five years of, of living happily are over with. And the family's forced to move to London and they move into the East End, one of the poorest regions that there is in London. Uh, to get by, uh, the family sells off their furniture. And, and Charles, who had a wonderful book collection for a young boy, is forced to sell off his book collection. Uh, I always think, you know, if, if we're going to talk about connecting authors to the literature, I often think here to uh, A Christmas Carol. And there's a scene when, with the ghost of Christmas past uh, back when the young, the young uh, Ebenezer Scrooge was left alone at his residential school when everyone else goes home for the holidays. And the ghost says something about you had no playmates, you had no friends. And uh, the young Ebenezer Scrooge starts talking about the books and the characters in the books that were his playmates. And the ghost says, but you didn't have any real playmates. And, and he says something like, you know, uh, Robinson Crusoe, not real. And, and it shows the importance of books to a small child. And we see that perhaps that this pain of Charles Dickens having to sell his own books at age 10, uh, kind of showing up in the bitter Ebenezer Scrooge, who as a boy, uh, perhaps was found his, his only kind of solace in, in reading books. I told you that the father ends up going to prison. It was the Marshall C. Debtors Prison. And he goes to prison for six months and the entire family can go to prison along with them. 
Uh, fortunately, Charles and his sister Fanny, and it's interesting too because Fan is the name of the sister of Ebenezer Scrooge in A Christmas Carol, uh, they're going to get rescued. They're the uh, oldest ones in the family at this time, and they have an aunt, I believe, who manages to get them out of prison and finds them jobs. And in Charles's case, he's going to work in a, a shoe polish. They called it blacking in those days. Uh, you use this stuff to keep any leather goods uh, black and shiny. And his job at this young age is to paste labels on these things by hand. And he's going to do it for the standard shift of 12 hours a day, six days a week. He later wrote about this as the darkest time in his life. This is a uh, an artist sketch, I, I'm sorry, I took this picture years and years ago and I don't have a source on it anymore, uh, but this is an artist sketch of what the outside of the prison looked like. You see, it doesn't look very prison-like. Uh, it was a debtor's prison. It wasn't a high security prison for uh, you know dangerous criminals or anything like that. Uh, Charles described this place as a living grave. I already described the job for you, but he said later, no words can express the secret agony of my soul. Even now, famous and happy, I wander desolately back to that time in my life. Uh, today, we would call this trauma, childhood trauma that affected the author. Uh, the Marshall Sea Prison is gone today. Uh, the ruins are here. Uh, the sign that's there designates these as, as the ruins, and this would have been the gate. Uh, but there, there is no prison anymore. And it was torn down because it was just such a horrible, horrible reminder of the inequities uh, that poor people faced in those days. Young Charles Dickens had very little formal schooling, uh, but he got an opportunity working as a law clerk. He had read books when he was young. Uh, as a law clerk, he's working with highly literate people. And uh, later on, he becomes a courtroom reporter, which means he's going to sit in court for long days, taking down notes of whatever happened, and then reproducing that for various sources. Might be for the attorneys he works for, it might be for a local newspaper. And you'll see once again in a lot of Charles Dickens stories, you have it at the beginning of A Tale of Two Cities, uh, courtroom dramas feature prominently. He understood what the courtroom was like and how the public often came out for entertainment. And if you think that going to a courtroom for entertainment sounds a little bit weird, turn on your afternoon TV, watch people and, uh, you know, tuning into things like the people's court or, uh, uh, Judge Judy or, or uh, you know, probably half a dozen other actual courtroom uh, dramas. They're not written. It's, it's real court cases that people love watching. He gets his first break uh, in, with a book called Sketches by Boz. So he didn't use the name Charles Dickens. He, he wrote these comedic sketches. When it says sketches, uh, that doesn't mean literally sketches drawn with a pencil uh, of images. Sketches can mean just a very, very short story of something which is usually funny. And he wrote a lot of these short pieces uh, and then published that book as, as his first one in 1836. Uh, with the success of the Pickwick Papers, which was another collection of, of shorter pieces, uh, he was able to buy his first real middle-class house. Uh, and this is the Doherty Street house. Houses feature prominently with uh, uh, Charles Dickens. He had this goal to keep moving up in houses. He had a target goal in mind. We'll get to that later on. Uh, but he, he met a woman named Catherine Hogarth, and now that he's solid middle class, he can marry her. Their marriage is going to be something that lasts through his entire life, uh, but unfortunately, they're going to be separated later on. Catherine is, is not educated. She's, she's evidently a wonderful mother, doting kind of caring mother, but she doesn't read, and she's married to an author, and they're going to drift slowly apart as their life together uh, moves on. Um, so anyway, uh, he purchases that house as he becomes more successful. Here's a younger, Char uh, not the youngest one that we just saw, but uh, this, we usually see Charles Dickens with a goatee, you know, with a mustache and, and the chin beard and things like that. And I, I like this picture. Uh, he always reminds me a little bit of, of maybe Charles Darnay or, or uh, uh, Jerry Cruncher or something like that. Uh, but some of his early novels, you, you've heard these titles, Oliver Twist, became a great Disney animated musical called Oliver and Company with uh, rock music and things like that. Great. If you've never seen it, wait for it to come out of the Disney vault and check that out. Uh, but you probably recognize some of these titles. His books were filled with lots of characters and many very comical characters. Later in his life, 
uh, some of the comedic nature of his books is going to fall by the wayside. This is not uncommon for authors. Uh, they tend to grow darker as they get older, especially in this time period. Uh, as he becomes more successful, he moves to a nice uh, countryside estate called this one Devonshire House, uh, 1840. By now, he would have been living like upper middle class. He would have had house servants. Uh, people would have made appointments. He would have always been properly dressed. There's never any downtime sort of thing. Uh, but this still wasn't the house he had his eye on. There's a house he wanted ever since he was uh, just a boy. So he's doing very, very well until his sister-in-law, whose name was Mary, dies. And he goes into this deep, deep state of depression. Uh, a lot of people have speculated, you know, wow, you know, he gets so depressed when his sister-in-law dies, even though he's sort of estranged from his wife. Was there something going on? There is no evidence that anything was going on other than the evidence that perhaps he identified more with Mary uh, than he did with Elizabeth. Anyway, it's after this uh, that his darker novels start to come forward. These are, these are novels uh, where everything doesn't always work out great for everybody. Um, and it's, they're going to also be very political heading out here. Now, in Charles Dickens, if, if you forget everything, I think the one thing that I would like you to remember is this is a man who was born into the middle class, experienced poverty, and then worked his way back up to upper middle class. He did not forget what it was like to be putting those labels on the pots of blacking for 12 hours a day. He always remembered the struggles of the poor class, the lower class of London. And, and in fact, many times, uh, some folks from the upper class, uh, you know, kind of like spoke out against his books because they believed he was challenging an age old way of life where the classes were to be expected. And if you were born into a lower class, too bad. That's just the way it was kind of thing. So you're going to see more autobiographical uh, type elements showing up as he makes his commentary uh, on society in these later works. Now, as I said, unfortunately, uh, Catherine doesn't show a whole lot of interest in his works, and they're going to start drifting apart. Charles Dickens, who goes out on the lecture tour and travels the world reading from his books, uh, gets interested in stage acting at one point. He literally appears on stage and takes a couple roles, and he becomes begins a relationship with a much younger uh, actor named Ellen Tiernan. It hurts his reputation for a while. Being unfaithful in a marriage, and we don't know how unfaithful he was, but to the public, it looked like he was being unfaithful. He himself said that he based Lucy Manette on that person. So again, another biographical element coming into uh, his literature here. Now, the house that he always wanted. There's a story that goes with this house. This one's called Gads Hill. And it's, it's uh, outside Rochester. Remember, that's kind of where he was born, where he started. This house is a much older house than the other ones. It was built around 1700. So that's, that's a pretty old house. Uh, but it was a classy kind of place. And the story goes that in those early days, when Charles Dickens was a boy, he would go walking the streets with his dad. And they walked past Gads Hill, and his father said to him one time, if you work very hard, son, one day you could afford a house like that. Now, I don't know to what extent the young boy decided one day I'll buy that house, but it is kind of ironic that Charles Dickens worked his way out of terrible poverty to come all the way to the point where he could buy this house that he saw when he was a child and was told this could be your goal one day. Again, just kind of cool. Now, A Tale of Two Cities, that's the one that you read in the summer and we're working with right now. Uh, it appeared in 1859. So later on this year, we're going to read The Killer Angels, which is a, a historical fiction, our second historical fiction after A Tale of Two Cities, uh, which deals with the American Civil War. And it's interesting because it's 1863 in that book and some of the characters happen to be reading A Tale of Two Cities, which is out for four years and it's big on the American market at that time. It's Charles Dickens' second historical novel. I believe it's one of only two. I don't think he did any other historical novels. And what a historical novel means is, because they all seem kind of historical to us today, but a historical novel means that it's, it's uh, a story that an author sets in a time period prior to his own existence. 
Charles Dickens was not alive in that time period, so it's a historical novel. If you read, for instance, uh, David Copperfield, that's set in the time period that Charles Dickens was alive. It seems historical to us because we weren't alive, but he was. The point about all of this is to write a historical novel, an author has to do research. You can't just write from natural experiences that you have. A Tale of Two Cities is one of these works in which Charles Dickens is going to start looking at this idea of social class and how finances and birth can affect what a person's life is like. He had been fed up with the ruling class of England at this time. Uh, he had seen that the Industrial Revolution just turned people into sometimes what they called wage slaves. You know, you're not literally in slavery, but if you want to survive, you need to make money. If you want to make money, you're going to have to take the low wages that we give you because we control everything. Uh, and this rift between the rich and the poor uh, was growing bigger and bigger. And he feared that if society didn't do something to stop that, there would be revolution. And so his warning to the people of England was, look at what happened in France when people completely ignored these same kinds of ideas. All right, now A Tale of Two Cities uh, doesn't have, I, I know it has a gazillion characters and you're like, oh my God, how am I gonna learn all these characters? Compared to a lot of Dickens books, it doesn't have that many characters and it lacks comical characters. There's very little humor in A Tale of Two Cities and, and what might've been intended as humor in Charles Dickens' day uh, really is, is disturbing today. Jerry Cruncher beating his wife because she's praying for him because he's a grave robber and he's afraid that if she prays for him, God will notice the crime and he'll get punished for that. That's, there's a little bit of humor in there, but it is really, really dark humor. You know, anytime a, a woman is being beaten by her husband, it's hard to call that humor. It's, it's, it's dark humor. Uh, you're going to find that a, a Tale of Two Cities doesn't even develop a lot of these characters to an extent. Take, you know, uh, Lucy Manette. She's a central figure. Everything happens in the story because of her. And yet she's very shallow as a character. This is a story that is all about plot. What is happening? What's going to happen next? Where's the irony? Where are the twists? That sort of thing. So it's a slightly different kind of novel for, uh, uh, for our author here. The other thing is most Charles Dickens stories happen in London. This one has, oh, it's a tale of two cities, right? This has some scenes in London, but almost everything very important takes place in France. And so that's a change for Charles Dickens. The other thing here is, is that some of these characters, while, while they're characters and they have names and they operate as a single person, we can start to really see them as symbolic for their class or for their type of worker or something like that. We'll talk about that as, as we go over the novel in class together. And, and you get really, really deep descriptions, beautiful language uh, used here by Charles Dickens uh, to describe the time period that they were living in. And I know, I know when you first start reading this and you get to that, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times that goes on for two whole pages. It's incredibly frustrating, but I promise you, once you read this novel and, and you've sort of digested it a little bit, if you go back and reread those first two pages, I think you'll find how beautiful they really are and how much they really say. And, and that's what great literature of the time period was like. You know, today we watch a, a, a TV sitcom and we may never watch it again. In Charles Dickens' day, books were incredibly expensive. And so you didn't just read a book one time. You wanted to read it and then read it again. And you wanted to have an experience the second time that gave you more than the first time did. And so this kind of, you know, sometimes I, I've heard it said that you can read a book on three levels. Number one, you read it for, is it a good story? Everybody can do that. Number two, you start looking for things like the themes and the symbolism and the messages kind of underlying the story. But that third and deepest level, which many readers never get to, is appreciating the language choice of the author. Every sentence could be crafted in any of, you know, dozens of other ways. And an author picks each word and picks the order of words, the syntax for that sentence. And when you get to that deeper, deeper level, you can appreciate something that an author like Charles Dickens was really a master at. It's never going to happen the first time through. Almost never anyway. Never say never, right? I just said never. Sorry. All right. Finally, um, 
the research that Charles Dickens used was based on an English a writer named Thomas Carlyle, who wrote something called History of the French Revolution. Carlyle interviewed a lot of firsthand, account, uh, firsthand people to get firsthand accounts of, of what happened at that time. We know today that Carlyle's History of the French Revolution is full of all kinds of exaggerations and outright errors, right? Charles Dickens had this as his source. He's writing fiction, so it doesn't really matter if he's not 100% historically accurate. When I give you some background to this novel, I'll try to tell you what Carlyle said, which is what Dickens would have known. And sometimes I'll also throw in what we know today from a more modern historical research of that time period. It begins in 1775. That's important to Americans and it, it plays a part in the, in the book because uh, that's when the American Revolution is getting underway. Uh, and it ends in 1793. Uh, so it's gonna cover an 18 year span. That's almost epic. So characters who start out fairly young end up middle-aged by the end of this book. It starts out just before the French Revolution of 1789, and it ends during the revolution. So the revolution is still going on. It ends in something called the Reign of Terror. When Robespierre was in charge of the revolution, uh, he had become paranoid, and we were at the point where uh, the French revolutionaries were, were beheading practically anyone that they thought might be a threat. Uh, the trials were, were, if you had a trial, you were going to the guillotine. Nobody escaped the French tribunals at that time. Uh, the book does include a, a, a flashback to an earlier time. That's going to be Dr. Manette's diary, and it's absolutely key to the entire novel. And we'll spend probably uh, an entire lesson just looking at Dr. Manette's diary later on. Uh, setting, as I said, is London and Paris, and every once in a while there's a rural scene thrown in there. The 12th novel by Charles Dickens, I, I won't ask you to remember that specific fact, but just understand that by the time A Tale of Two Cities comes out, he is a world famous accomplished novelist. This is not a breakthrough novel, right? This is a guy who's making money at this job. Here's the interesting thing about A, a, a Tale of Two Cities. We talked a moment ago about a, the cost of books at that time. Well, Charles Dickens realized that it's hard to sell an expensive book to lots of people, but it's easy to sell a magazine. And so he bought and owned a magazine called All the Year Round. And it was a literary magazine. They were very popular at the time. And what he did was over the course of, of time from April till November of the year that it came out, every month he published a little bit more of the story in a serialized format. And so somebody could start in April and read the first part, and you had to wait a month till part two came out. In the meantime, you talked about part one, and other people wanted to read it. Sometimes they borrowed your copy. Sometimes they went and bought a new copy. Then in May, part two comes out. People who hadn't read part one hear about part two, so they track down part one. Then they buy part two. And this is going to go on month after month after month. Uh, more and more interest in this novel is going to grow. And then when the whole novel's finished and you've absolutely loved the adventure, it comes out as a book. And people who bought every installment now go out and spend the money to buy it as a book so they can read it again. It was a brilliant strategy for making money. And Charles Dickens was one of the first to exploit this system, but a lot of other writers, including American writers, are going to do this as well. Uh, later on then, uh, Charles Dickens goes on a, a worldwide reading tour. Like I said, this was a very popular thing to do. Uh, and he did public readings to, uh, he would literally go uh, to theaters and fill every seat. People were coming out to see Charles Dickens and hear him read excerpts uh, from his, his works. If you're a Doctor Who fan and you know I am, uh, there's an episode uh, from the Ninth Doctor um, called The Unquiet Dead. And it centers around uh, it centers around Charles Dickens going out and reading to the public. It's a great episode. Check it out sometime. Uh, President Johnson in America, he's the one who succeeded Abraham Lincoln after the assassination. Uh, he actually went to hear Charles Dickens in Washington, D.C. every night for a week. That's how popular Dickens was, especially when you think that a president would want to go back into a theater so soon. But that's another story. 
the World Lecture Tour took a lot out of, of Charles Dickens. He's going to come back to England by 1870. And unfortunately, uh, he's going to meet his demise in a, a very unusual end. By 1870, he's working on a new type of writing for him. He's working on a mystery. And it's called The Mystery of Edwin Drood. And you know that the most important thing about a mystery is the end, the finding out who done it kind of thing. And unfortunately, Dickens is going to die before he finishes this book. He leaves the mystery completely a mystery for us. Uh, he's at dinner one night. He's eating. He's not been well. He's, we know he's been sick. And all of a sudden, without any prompting, he rises to his feet. He says, I'm going to London. And he collapses to the floor. He dies the next day. Uh, my understanding is he never regained consciousness. Uh, Charles Dickens is buried in Poets Corner of Westminster Abbey. Uh, you see the outside of Westminster Abbey, and then you see the photograph of the inside. And if you want to kind of see, there's, there's a map in the lower left here, uh, shows you where Poets Corner is. So this little part right here is what you're seeing in this image off to the right, right there. And I promised you at the very beginning of this, I would show you Charles Dickens' writing desk. That is the desk where Charles Dickens wrote A Tale of Two Cities and just about everything else, sitting in a chair, hunched over, dipping his pen and scratching out the words on paper. And there on the right, an aged Charles Dickens, that is the last known photograph that we have of the writer. And so you know how A Tale of Two Cities ends? We'll end this presentation here today uh, with the quote from uh, Sidney Carton, playing Charles, uh, Charles Darnay as he goes to the guillotine. And on the right here, I have a, a statue of Charles Dickens sitting up there on that pedestal with Little Nell, one of the characters from the old curiosity shop. And it's interesting because you can find this statue today, not in London, but it's in Fairmont Park in Philadelphia. And so uh, just kind of shows again that Charles Dickens was a worldwide phenomenon. All right, so that's everything for Meet Charles Dickens. I know this video went longer than it should have. I always go longer than they should because I get excited about this stuff. I only hope sometimes that my excitement might be infectious. So I'll see you in class. Thanks for staying to the end of this video. Take care and be safe.